So the first, there was Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. And then after that, came Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala. After the Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim, a narration collected by both of them, they'll say, agreed upon. After this, then we have the compilers of the Sunan, meaning Abu Dawood, Al-Tirmidhi, Al-Nasai, and Ibn Majah. And the first one is Imam Abu Dawood, that's his kunya. His first name is Sulaiman, and his father's name is Al-Ash'ath, Sulaiman ibn Al-Ash'ath. And he's from Sajistan. And Sajistan currently, you would say it's like southern Afghanistan, or southwest Afghanistan, and some of it might even enter into Iran. And that's where the Imam was from, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he was born in the year 202 after Hijrah. Now Imam Abu Dawud, rahimahullah ta'ala, he started to seek knowledge from a young age from those in his land. And at the age of about 15 years old, he started to travel. The benefit of learning from a young age is that you find that whatever you memorize, for example, you memorize Juz Amma, or you memorize a number of surahs from a young age, these things normally stick with you for life. See, before what would happen is that when a person is young, they would try to get them to memorize as much as possible. Even if they don't understand everything they're memorizing, it doesn't make a difference. And then as they go older, as they grow older, then they will start to work on the understanding. But if a person was to look at things nowadays, they'll find that um, that particular style is lost to an extent. Imam Abu Dawud, he started to seek knowledge. He started with his own land. And after that, he left with his brother Muhammad. And they both went to seek knowledge together. And they traveled extensively. He went to Mecca, to Medina, Iraq, Egypt. He went across the Muslim lands. And here we have something else, which is the fact that he had his brother with him. This is another thing that you find a lot of the people of the past, when they would go seek knowledge, they would have a companion with them. It helps them get far, but not only that, but when they're a bit negligent, their brother or whoever it is, they remind them. And they both went to start seeking knowledge. And he, and he went to each land, you know, gathering a large amount of knowledge. And see, we, something that we learn here as well is that Imam Abu Dawood ta'ala, had a large amount of teachers, which is another really important point. As some of the people of the past, they would say that a person who enters into knowledge without a teacher, he leaves without knowledge. Now, Abu Dawood ta'ala, after traveling extensively and studying extensively, he authored his Sunan, Sunan Abi Dawood. He authored it at a young age and he presented it to Imam Ahmad. And Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad was very impressed by it. And generally speaking, it was given acceptance at the time of the author. That when we look at the people of the past, they wouldn't just author books just like that. Then most people who do stuff like that at a young age, and they haven't really, they're not fully qualified, a lot of the time, they have a lot of regrets. When the people of the past, they've done it, look, he's, he's done it, and then he presents it to Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed from the, from the most senior scholars of his time. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, was impressed by it. What does that mean? It means that this person must have been fully, he must have been fully qualified. And he had a number of other works as well, but this was the most famous one. When you look at his book, it's more focused on ahkam. It's different to Bukhari, a Muslim, and a Tirmidhi. Bukhari, a Muslim, and a Tirmidhi, they have a bit of, you know, they've got stuff on creed. They've got stuff on heart softeners. It's very comprehensive. Abu Dawood's book is mainly focused on, on ahkam, on rulings. So tahara, you know, which includes wudu, and the, you know, invalidators, tayammum, having a bath when it's an obligation, menstruation, 
Then you go into salah and the different types of salah, the prerequisites, and then the actual prayer. Um, when you forget, when you make a mistake, and then the different types, salatul jumu'ah, the Friday prayer, the eclipse prayer, the rain prayer. And you do the same for zakah, fasting, hajj, trade and transactions, you know, buying and selling, marriage, divorce, until the end. So he's just mainly focused on that. Although he has a few other topics in the sunan, but it's heavily focused on ahkam. In comparison to Bukhari and Muslim um, and at Tirmidhi. Imam Ahmad ta'ala, was, Abu da- was one of Abu Dawood's most prominent teachers. And when they describe Imam Ahmad, ta'ala, they mention Abu Dawood, they say he resembled Imam Ahmad. He was one of those who, who benefited greatly from Imam Ahmad. Ta'ala. Although he benefited from many others, this was one of those who he really got affected by. And he would also tell his, fa- tell his son about Imam Ahmad and how great he used to think Imam Ahmad really was. And this is something else, which is the fact that, as we just commented, Abu Dawood learned his mannerisms. Mannerisms from Imam Ahmad. When you study from a book, the book doesn't, you can't look at the book and see the way the book acts. You may be reading from a book and gaining a lot of stuff, but you find, subhanAllah, a lot of the time, when a person is heavily focused on just studying from a book, meaning the book is the main teacher of that person, you find that this person will normally have or lack in terms of their mannerisms. And they, sometimes they're very courageous in discrediting others. And they're very like arrogant at times too. They haven't learned from a teacher. So this is another beautiful factor of how the people of the past they would also learn from the mannerisms of their teacher. Imam Abu Dawud rahimahullah ta'ala was also known as a hafiz. Yeah, and a hafiz during that time was not like just a person who memorized the Quran. It's like a person who's memorized like at least 100,000 narrations with their chains. And Imam Abu Dawud rahimahullah ta'ala was known as one of the people of his era, one of the people of his time. That one of the giants of his time. And he mentions himself, he said, I wrote 500,000 narrations with my own hands. Which is another thing. When you look at all of these people, it's not just their sincerity and everything else. These people, they worked very, very hard. Very, it's like they dedicated their life for Allah's religion. And Allah Jalla granted them acceptance. So this is another thing, anyone who wants to take the path of knowledge, especially if you wanted to go abroad, like you find a lot of brothers and sisters always wanting to go abroad, to go seek knowledge. And when you look at their situation in, in, in England, there, there's ample opportunities, yet you don't see them grabbing onto any of them. If they don't grab onto anything here, how, what are they going to do when they go abroad? They're, not gonna, they're just going to sleep it out. That's what they're going to do. And then I spent five years there or this many years. They've been sleeping. That's what's been happening. They haven't really been doing anything. Finally, Imam Abu Dawud, ta'ala, although he done all of this amazing stuff and he was traveling, his son was born when he was approximately 28 years old. His kunya is Abu Bakr and his first name is Abdullah. When his son was born, from a very young age, he, worked, he started to work on his son. His son, due to the, you know, due to the uh, amazing nature of his father, when his father is traveling extensively, he's making sure that his son's with him. His son's studying with him too. He's, meaning going to the same place. There was one scholar by the name of Ahmad ibn Salih. Imam al-Dhahabi quotes in Sayyid al There was one statement. There was one scholar, Ahmad ibn Salih. And he wouldn't allow young people without a bed to enter into his gathering. So in some of the narrations, Imam Abu Dawood actually tied a bed to his, to his son. And then the scholar Ahmad ibn Salih he said, to someone like me, you're playing around, like you're doing, you're doing this sort of action, you know, this drama to me. He said, look, please don't, you know, don't say, don't rebuke me or anything like that. It's just that I want to, I, just like all of these people, all of these adults, they're benefiting. I want him to also benefit the same as well. And if you feel that he doesn't match them, no problem then. Don't allow him to hear anything. And then in some of the narrations, they said, so when they, act, when they gathered him together with these people who were way older than him, they found that he had surpassed a lot of them. And his son, like who, Imam al-Dhahbi, when he quotes, um, when he talks about him, he said that they said he was on the same level as his father and some classified him to be above his father. Like one time when he was in one country, 
And he said that, and I didn't have none of my books. This is Abu Dawood's son. So they said, go on, narrate some narrations. So he said, look, I don't have my books with me. He said, yeah, and is this going to stop the son of Abu Dawood that he doesn't have his books with him? So he says, then I started quoting until I quoted 30,000 narrations. After that, they had transcribed all of them and passed it on to some other great giants of hadith. And they analyzed all 30,000 and they found that he had made six mistakes. He said, when I look back at the six mistakes, three of them was how it was narrated to me. Meaning they weren't his mistakes. It was the person before him or the person before him who made the mistake. And he said, in three of them, I actually slipped. That meaning he actually made a mistake out of 30,000. And his son was the um, one who wrote the famous poem in, in, in Aqidah and in Creed, which is famously known as al Ha'iya, which is approximately about 33, 34 lines of poetry. And why it's called al Ha'iya is because every, um, the end of every line of poetry ends with a ha. And it's reckoned that this was, a number of them reckon that this was the first poem in Aqidah that has ever been written. And this is by Abu Dawud, his, his son. So he had his son who became an amazing alim too. And then eventually he resided in Basra. For one of the governors asked Abu Dawud, he said, I have three requests for you. One of them is for you to go and reside in Basra. So all of the students of knowledge from all over can come and seek knowledge from you. And the second one is that I want you to narrate the Sunan, your book, to my children. And the third one, I want to have, a, I want to have an exclusive gathering for my children. So he said, as for the first two, the first one, that I'm going to go live in Basra, I can accept that. The second one, you want me to narrate my book to your children, I can accept that too. But as for the third one, give him them something exclusive, he said, that's not possible. It says, for people when it comes to knowledge are the same, are equal. And then he remained in Basra until he departed in the year 375 after Hijrah. And that's the end of the biography of Imam Abu Dawood. We ask Allah to have mercy upon his soul and to have mercy on all of the rest of the Imams from the A'imma of the Muslims. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.